Okay, what looks like we've stabilized. Okay, we're good to go. Let's go. Okay. Welcome to Balticon and to this talk on artificial intelligence, its past, present, and possible futures. My name is John Ashmead. I'm a programmer by day. I write and publish uh, uh, papers on physics and uh, quantum mechanics and time. And I'd like to give you a little bit of background on where artificial intelligence is today, what we mean by it, and what the possible future of artificial intelligence is likely to be. So by the end of this talk, you'll have at least a basic understanding of the role of artificial intelligence in our society. And I'll give you some references on where to go next. So we're going to do a little bit of reflection, as you can see from the picture, on what artificial intelligence is about. So first, a bit of history on artificial intelligence. At the top left is a wonderful uh, shot from a great Ray Harryhausen stop motion uh, picture, Jason and the Argonauts, I think it was. That's Talos, an artificial creature, uh, creature imagined in Greek mythology, giant figure of bronze, uh, gripping his throat, which is, I hope, not an omen for this talk, and done in by his Achilles heel. Uh, so people have been imagining artificial creations for a long time. The uh, second picture is of the Antikythera, the first uh, really uh, very spectacular instance of a kind of computer found in a uh, sea wreck about 200 BC. It was being shipped from Greece to Rome with its own attendant documentation in the form of a slave who would explain it and turn the cranks. The Antikythera gives you a picture of the positions of the moon, the planets, and the sun for quite a few years back in the past and into the future with all kinds of commentary um, and was extraordinarily sophisticated. What you're looking at there is a modern recreation of it because it was found bronze and a bit corroded on the sea floor. But it shows we've been looking for aids to thought for a long time. The next picture is of something called the Mechanical Turk which pretended to be an artificial chess playing machine. It actually worked with a hidden little man inside the uh, machinery. Uh, pay no attention to the man within the machine will be a theme of this talk. And played and beat Napoleon Bonaparte and Benjamin Franklin in its tours of Europe. And the final um, slide is a modern recreation of Babbage's difference engine. It was a computer that Babbage uh, invented in the uh, 19th century, but which could never actually have been built because the machine tolerances of the day were not good enough to build a machine that complicated and have it actually work. So there's a long history of at least the desire to create artificial intelligences, but it's not until very recently that we've seen successes. Now, in science fiction, the classical artificial intelligence is basically a kind of um, robot human. This is a delightful set of humorous science fiction stories uh, by Henry Kuttner. And the robot you can see in the picture there is a transparent robot who spends most of his time admiring himself in the mirror. Our hero is a guy named Gallagher, an inventor, who invents wonderful things while drunk, like this robot, and then can't figure out what he's done while he's sober. Uh, the robot was actually invented as an automated beer can opener, but until our inventor can figure that out, he can't get any use out of the robot. The robot knows who it is, it knows who Gallagher and other people are. It's pretty contemptuous of them. And it knows how to learn from experience. So it's very human after its fashion. It's a kind of specialized human. And most of the artificial intelligences that we see in science fiction, in films and uh, books and so forth are very sophisticated. They know that they exist, that we exist. They have a clear sense of what the world is about. That's not actually what we're talking about when we say artificial intelligence today. 
Where is AI now? That would be strong or general AI. What we have now is not that. Our AI systems have no common sense. We also have some very funny examples of that. They have no, what I call ontology. They have no sense of the real world. They see an image as just a bunch of pixels. Uh, they don't know that there are shapes behind that. And they're very specialized. They have a narrow focus. What caused this to all take off was three developments. First off, big data, uh, the kind of data that's turned up by Google search, by Twitter and so forth, creating huge quantities of data that have to be gone through. And you just haven't got enough programmers to piece through this. Big CPUs, of parallel processing, the graphics processors for games and so forth, which have the ability and principle to go through the big data, but you don't have the time to program them. And then there were a few big wins for AI, like Google Translate and Alpha Zero and Watson and so forth. And firms have been selling commercial AI products for the last five or 10 years, and some major successes. What we mean by AI is not the kind of robots that we see in science fiction. It means a piece of software which can engage in unsupervised and evolving machine learning. The unsupervised is critical because a programmer doesn't have to tell it what to do, only what we want it to find. And it will look at these huge quantities of data and return patterns that it finds in them, often correctly. And it can do these things at better than human levels, at least with respect to certain characteristics. Okay, um, I see that there are already questions starting in the Q&A and I welcome them. I put a couple of breakpoints in this talk. We'll take a look at the questions, look at what's accumulated and see what I can do with that. And I'll go on with the first section of this now and then get to questions at the first break. Thank you, I welcome them. Now, the most omnipresent form of AI is search. We all deal with this every day when we do a Google search. And this is a Netflix recommendation page. It's showing you a whole bunch of movies that you might want to see. Recommendation is a lot trickier than you might think. You have to show people something that's like what they've already liked, but different. And it's the but different which makes it hard to program these things. So you use AI systems to look at all the choices people are making and then to say, okay, if they clicked or if they didn't click on any or only clicked on the 20th choice, how can we look at patterns to make that choice number one the next time? And the AI is continually trying to figure out how to give you links at the top of Google search or films at the top of Netflix or books at the top of Amazon, which you're going to click on. But what's going to happening on the inside is not just that the uh, AI system at Google is producing these choices for you, is that it's then selling them to someone else. And underneath that screen is a chaotic mass of AIs from all sorts of advertisers uh, bidding for your attention. You are the commodity when you do a search. And you've got all these little bits of software saying, um, I'm willing to pay a tenth of a cent for this guy's time for 100 milliseconds, something like that. So you're actually part of an extraordinary market, and it's all happening in milliseconds. And you don't see any of this. Now, one of the most important uses of AI just in the last year is in our war on COVID-19. There is no part of the war on COVID-19, which does not use AI. It's used to spot case spikes, to track where patients are, how to move equipment around, what um, kind of treatments are working, to figure out how is the virus doing its harmful work, what strategies might it be using, uh, what is the meaning of the variant viruses, what kind of immunization campaigns will work best, and so forth. 
Uh, COVID generates massive quantities of data and the huge research effort on this, over 200,000 papers so far, means that the data can only be tamed using AI technology. So that's very important as well. Now, the most dramatic single case of AI is probably the driverless car. I call this a Terminator view of what a driverless car is looking at. It's taking a whole bunch of pixels and putting square boxes around it, trying to divide it up into real objects and then figure out their velocities and motion and what the stop signs are and so forth um, and make calculations about what its correct next move is. It does this really well. It's probably fairly safe for long haul trucking on a highway. It's less safe for something like um, traffic in a busy, complicated environment like uh, Lagos in Nigeria or something when you have many different kinds of traffic. On the inside is a lot of extraordinary tech um, cooperating to create this. LIDAR, which is a brilliant kind of laser scanning system, only in high-end driverless cars, a uh, camera, of course, GPS, of course, it's monitoring the wheels, uh, pulling all this information together to give an accurate picture of what's out there. And it may even be safer than just a regular driver uh, for routine driving. So this is an evolving form of AI. There have been some spectacular failures of this stuff uh, where because AI doesn't understand anything, it can make really elementary mistakes. If you want to break a driverless car and you happen to have a pink unicorn on your hands, a herd the pink unicorn in front of the car, the car won't know what to make of it. It can't cope with novelty the way a human can. Now the breakthrough application for AI, the thing that really changed the mind share was AlphaGo. This was a piece of software which became world champion at Go. This was significant because Go is considered to be the most complex game on the planet, much more so than chess. And yet it was able to beat a, the best world Go player in a series of rounds. And in fact, one of its moves is now famous. It was just completely unexpected. Uh, Alpha Go was specialized for Go. Alpha Zero is a program that was able to beat AlphaGo and is able to learn any game, Go, chess, checkers, and Soji. And it's so brilliant that its only true competitor is itself. It learns a game by playing against itself hundreds and thousands of games in order to find what the best possible moves are. And this change the way people think about it. Go and chess are not economically that important, but computer researchers care a lot about these high-end intellectual exercises and said, wow, and here is a software that can learn an arbitrary game. Um, okay, and there are a lot of other uh, uses for AI, it's all over. This is a personal favorite. Um, we all know about the problem of traffic children. The traffickers have to advertise their children and they do so by showing them in a hotel room, which is pretty anonymous, but every hotel is a little bit different. And the curtains, the furniture, the wallpaper, the paint may have enough identifiable characteristics that the AI can spot which hotel that is and take police to that hotel. So that's a quiet but powerful application. Another a favorite of mine is finding exoplanets. Um, that as a matter of chance, exoplanets are found sometimes by using what's described in the slide called micro lensing. The exoplanet happens to find itself in a situation where it's between a remote star and the earth and its own star can act as a kind of lens and focus the light from it onto a telescope. 
But this is very brief while the planet's in exactly the right position. There are hundreds of thousands of possible cases and it's just too minute and boring for people to keep focus on it. And AI can be trained to look for this and then scan say all of the Kepler satellites data to find as many uh, exoplanets as possible. Another brilliant use of AI. Another favorite use of mine is trying to understand how human thought works. In the top frames, we have a real Monet and then a photograph constructed by an AI to look like the photograph that um, Monet might have been working from if they had photos back then. And of course, the AI that can run one way can run the other. Um, it can take a real photo and redo it in the style of Monet a little bit like all those filters you have on your smartphone for uh, cameras. And this gets to one of the themes of this talk on AI. Uh, this is one of my favorite pictures, Twittering Machine by Paul Clay, a uh, cranked bunch of artificial birds giving artificial song. And that's a little bit like AI. It pretends to think, and by doing so, it helps us understand what thinking is really about. What the AI does well and does poorly tells us a lot about how we think. And we'll have a couple of illustrations of that later on as well. And indeed, if we use AIs properly, we may be able to extend and strengthen what we mean by human and more of that as well. Okay, so this is a brief pause slide. I see two questions uh, in the Q&A. Uh, the second one, will I talk about Bay bias in AI, I will emphatically talk about bias in AI, it's a major problem. And who owns the value system for AI? The problem is that it's not you. And that's a very important question as well, and we'll discuss the meaning of that question a little bit. So thanks for those two questions. Now we're going to look at the components of AI, the parts that go into it. What does an AI system actually do? Well, it's got inputs, it's got processing, and it's got outputs. What else could it have? So we're gonna look at the inputs first. And like everything else real in this world, most of your time is spent doing scut work. That data scientists spend most of their time cleaning and organizing data, uh, whether it's from a Twitter feed or medical instruments or a telescope. That data is seldom in a state where it can just be used by the AI system. You have to get it prepped and figure out how to clean this up. So most of AI uh, practical work is dull, but necessary. Uh, mining data for patterns and refining algorithms, what we think of as classic AI data scientist work is like uh, about a sixth or less of the time that they spend on doing things. Now, there are a lot of different sources of input data. Every click and every keystroke on your computer when you're connected to the web is probably being used by some AI to figure out what you're up to, particularly if you're on a search or a marketing site. And we'll discuss more of that too. One of my favorites is facial recognition. The way facial recognition works in general is by taking the image of a face, usually like say off a CCTV camera, breaking it out into triangles, which uh, software likes to work with, and then comparing the set of triangles to one of a set of what are called eigenfaces and saying your, your face is like 30% of this typical face and 10% that, so we can assign a kind of vector representation of your face. Uh, this is a beautiful craft, crafting of that idea into a work of art. Sometimes what AI does can be a kind of art in its own right. Okay, that's a very rough summary of, of the input side of AI. The heart of AI is the algorithms, the rules that let it analyze a huge data set without a programmer telling it what to do. There are three important algorithms that AI uses. Uh, neural nets, genetic algorithms, and swarms. We'll start with neural nets. Uh, these are modeled on the networks of neurons in your 
uh, own brain. That first picture at the top left was of the neurons of the eye uh, from a stain from a century or so ago. And what you have in a neural net are a bunch of inputs carefully cleaned up by data scientists, a bunch of connections. You see all the little arrows going around all over the place here. And it goes through several layers of this and comes out into an output layer with a conclusion like, yes, that's a cat. No, that's not a cat. It's first, it usually starts off with random settings for all of the hidden layers and the usual results are crap. And an analysis program, a value program says, okay, what we're looking at is no good. And these are the errors. And then the output layer looks at the errors and says, well, you know, if my inputs were a little different and I added them up a little differently, then I would have gotten closer to the target. So the output layer sends some pushback to the hidden layer for the last hidden layer. And it pushes back to the previous hidden layer. And they all, it's like a finger pointing dance. They all try to get their little fingers to point a little better. And they just keep doing this and doing this until it settles into, yes, that's a cat and no, that's a dog. And that's all that's going on here. It's a whole bunch of committees, each trying to look a little better. Now the next type of AI algorithm is genetic algorithm. These are based on another biological phenomena called uh, just the way your chromosomes come together. Like you have one set of chromosomes, 23 of them from your mother, 23 of them from your father. When they combine, the proportions of various genes are quite different in you and you're a different person. You resemble your mother and father, but you're different. Furthermore, each chromosome will often experience a crossover incident where the top and bottom halves are flipped. So the combinations in you are a little different than they were in your uh, parents. And these are, the crossovers tend to move whole genes. And since sets of genes are important, which sets are working together is important. And individual genes can also experience mutations where one base pair or another is changed and the resulting protein is a little different. Usually mutations do harm. Sometimes they open up new possibilities. Now I was trying to think of a good way to show you this in action. And I realized that this slide itself, the slide where I explain GAs in action is a good example of a GA. So when I started off this talk, when I first set it up, I put all the techie stuff like the algorithms at the start because I'm a tech guy and I put the uses later. But I realized that a good presenter first explains what it's good for and then tells you how it's done once you realize that it's worth paying attention to that. So I had a crossover event. I pushed the uses up front and the algorithms into the middle. And that made the talk better. And then I mutated each of the slides. I said, I want each slide to be as best as, as good as it can be. And some of the slides I just, just left alone like that one about exoplanets. Then the art slide, I found some pictures that were better. The swarms, I decided I liked my bees. You'll be seeing them in a moment. Um, the Netflix, you know, I added a slide and the net, uh, neural nets, I added a slide. And then, you know, in one case on the COVID thing, I added like a, a dramatic picture of a COVID virus and then I took it out. I said, no, people would get it anyway. And finally, we come to this slide itself. So this slide includes itself in an infinite regress. If you have the kind of eyes that can see all the way down here, it's the slide inside itself, inside itself until we run out of pixels. So that's a genetic algorithm of a very practical kind. Now the third kind of uh, basic algorithm for AI is the swarm. Uh, picture a bunch of honeybees or wasps looking for food and the bees head out in the morning, you know, briefcases in hand looking for sugar. And mostly they don't find it. And a couple do find it and they come back to the hive and the few who have found it have done their famous honeybee dance to tell the other bees where it is. And then the bees will gradually converge on today's sources of useful nectar and they just keep doing it. The key to success with swarm, the swarm approach is know your losers. 
you're sending out a thousand or 10,000 bee scouts in the morning. And that would be a great waste of effort, except most of them don't waste time on the losers. They all focus fairly quickly on the winners. So the end result is actually quite efficient. The other thing you'll notice in this is that all three of the algorithms, neural nets, genetic algorithms, and swarms are based on examples in regular biology and ecology. If there's one thing AI scientists know how to do, it's steal from nature. And a good thing too. Now we get to the outputs. Uh, there are lots of different outputs. You've seen like the Netflix recommendation, the um, link, the set of links that you see from Google. It might be a bunch of photographs if it's uh, Tinder or something. Uh, this is one of my favorite output uh, diagrams. It's a bunch of hand gestures. We're all very good at hand gestures. Um, and it's how an AI sees them or how a computer sees them. It breaks it down into lines and joints, and then it will work out what gestures are meant from the patterns of the lines and the joints. And uh, there are other outputs, which might be say music or buzzing, and we'll have an example of that later on. Um, basically anything that a human or another computer system can read can be an output. Now, one of the cleverest uses of this is by a mechanical drawing software called Autodesk, which is used to build tractors and skyscrapers and ships and so forth. And they came up with an AI module they call Dreamcatcher. They don't usually name things that much fun, uh, that fancy. And it's used to uh, build better parts. So on the left, we have one antenna design, a radio antenna used for a satellite, I think, designed by a human. And the one on the right is an antenna designed by an AI. And it turned out to be twice as efficient. And the reason it's twice as efficient is because a human can only think of 10 or 100 or 1,000 possibilities. The AI can go through a million. Uh, so you would think that AI designs would be mechanical, logical, Vulcan, because it's a machine. That's not actually how it works. Here's on the left a pipe design designed for strength and whatever other properties are important. The one on the left is, again, the human design. The one in the middle is uh, AI partway through, and the one on the right is fully uh, the final product of an AI system. You'll notice that the one on the right looks much more organic, almost a kind of alien biology. And the reason is that nature, like AI systems, goes through millions and trillions of possibilities, and natural shapes look organic partly because they have been refined and rounded off through billions of years of evolution. So it'll do all sorts of, satisfy all sorts of complicated requirements by doing each one about enough. And you can really move to very much higher levels of sophistication. You can get very meta with this. Uh, here is a neural net. That's a network of a little neurons doing various thinky things. And the neural net was itself designed by a genetic algorithm. So that's two layers of AI technology at work here. Um, and you'll see this sort of thing stuff in like uh, the camera focusing algorithms on your smartphone are using AI on the inside all over for this. Now, in the last year, we've uh, had a lot of spectacular developments in AI, and there's certainly not enough time to um, mention uh, more than a small fraction of them, but I thought I'd put a few fun ones up presented for your consideration. Uh, just in the news the last few weeks on uh, is the first helicopter on Mars. Now that's a simulation of it. It's going from one place to another. You see the two rotors so it can keep stability. I guess they're probably counter rotating. There are wind gusts on Mars. The air is thin, but there are still gusts. And the time for a signal to get from Mars to Earth is from anywhere from three minutes to 22 minutes, and to get back the same. If the helicopter could only respond to wind gusts by waiting for an engineer on Earth, 
to get that uh, problem and then get the instruction, the helicopter would have crashed. So the helicopter has an AI system. Its name is Ingenuity, which is appropriate. And that AI system is in charge of keeping it stable and on target uh, in spite of wind currents and surprises and so forth. So it wouldn't be possible to fly the helicopter on Mars without AI. This is another delightful use. Uh, we've heard of robotic surgery in the sense of remote hands, little tiny hands called Waldos that surgeons use to do laparoscopy and thread um, like uh, fiber optics through so they can do heart surgery with less, uh, less uh, cutting open the patient. This goes a step beyond Waldos. It's actually an AI system for controlling the arms itself. So the surgeon gives high level orders and then the AI system translates them into low level instructions. Go here, go here, go here. This is a picture of a surgeon training on the system to learn how to use it to pick um, objects up and put them down on another um, post. Uh, the surgeons have to train a lot on this, but then they can pull back and go from low level to high level instruction on the surgery. Again, brilliant and a potential lifesaver. And in fact, you can use AI not just to do existing things better, but to invent new senses. Uh, the first thing we'll look at is an instrument called Buzz. If you see the wristband on the guy's right arm, that translates sounds into vibrations so he can be focused on whatever the task is and then pay attention to his outside at the same. It's been for use uh, by deaf people, for instance, or hard of he hearing people, but any signal can be translated into vibrations. And now this person has a way to sense anything that can be turned into a series of bites. The neuroscientist who invented this, David Eagleman, says he wants to think of this as a way to create new systems of perception where there's a combination of sensors, AI working out with the, uh, the incoming data, mo uh, monitoring it, and then of people seeing high level information about the system. And if we have new sensors, then we need new limbs. This is a real fun one. A uh, artist named Danny Claude invented a third thumb. And if you search for her on YouTube, you'll see a picture of her shuffling cards or swiping on an iPad with her third thumb. This particular thumb is a little bit of a cheat. She's actually controlling it with her feet rather than with brain waves, which you really want for classic AI. But you can see where we're going that we can give people new limbs. So the possibilities are extraordinary. OK. And now everybody's favorite section. I see there have already been two questions about bias, and that will be my first slide here. And then a couple of other um, subjects of kinds of risks that we expect from AI. So this is a very famous problem with bias. AI systems are normally designed by a white, male programmers in California age from 20 to 40 who work for a large company like Google or a startup who hang out with each other in a small number of cities in California. And when they're looking for test data for their face recognition, they look for their friends. They go to, hey, Jube in the Joe in the next cube, come on over and let's see if it spots your face. And this black AI researcher found that her face couldn't be recognized by some of the Google, I think it was Google, somebody's uh, facial software, unless she put a white mask on. That is beyond offensive. And it wasn't that they meant this maliciously, is that they didn't think to widen their, bot, their input set. Remember how I said data scientists were spending a lot of time on their inputs? Well, they didn't spend quite enough time. They didn't look at, have I looked at all the people who I might be trying to recognize? So that the input, so that an out of the box facial recognition system will typically be good 
for white males in the 20 to 40 age range and not so good for anyone else. And in fact, Google had to actually yank some facial recognition software when it identified blacks as gorillas, which is just beyond horrific. And everybody got appalled by that one and it opened up the mind of AI workers to the possibility. This is also a major problem for medical research because if you train your medical system uh, to um, uh, on only a standard set of patients like um, middle-aged white males again, it may have terrible problems working with children, with the elderly, with people of different races and so forth. Um, and you have to make sure that your systems are trained on the data that you're actually planning to support. Okay, so that was a wake up call for a lot of people. And this researcher, this picture which she uh, set up is a brilliant shot of what the problem is. She was a big help to the field identifying this issue. Now, one of the problems here, one of the fundamental problems with AI is that it doesn't have an ontology. It's like the driverless cars and everything else. AI doesn't see objects. You and I see people, we see plants, we see houses, we see objects. And from when we're just born to the present, we are always interpreting the pictures we see in terms of the objects we expect to see. We have this incredible feedback loop going all the time. AI doesn't do that. This is from a, a worker named Zagetti, a researcher. On the left, at the first picture, we see a school bus the AI sees the school bus. Then Segetti and his fellow researchers said, but we know how AI screws stuff up and we'll create a small amount of noise. This is a small bit of noise, which is being added to the picture. The noise is so small that you and I can't see the difference in the school bus. It's there, but it's too subtle. But the AI thinks it's an ostrich. The noise was skillfully calibrated to trick the AI into thinking that that's an ostrich. And the way the, AI, the trick was done is that an ostrich has a specific texture to its feathers and the AI and the AI is not looking at the shapes, it's looking at the textures. And that little bit of noise spoofed the textures. Another example, here's a temple, left and right AI grades a temple, Carefully calibrated noise, AI ostrich. Here's a praying mantis on the left. We're all agreed about that. A uh, little bit of noise, ostrich. And here's a Shih Tzu, immensely cute Shih Tzu, if that's how you pronounce it, on the left. And you guessed it, it's the ostrich again. So you can trick an AI into seeing what you want it to see. And a human seeing the picture won't know that you're doing anything like this. You have to calibrate the trick to the specific AI and so forth. But because they always, uh, they tend to, the neural nets tend to go for textures, which are easier for them to decode than for shapes, because that would require them to know something about the world. All AIs currently in the field, or almost all of them, are vulnerable to this kind of spoofing. And imagine an AI tricked into thinking that a child is a combatant say a military AI, uh, the downside potential of this kind of error is pretty serious. And one of the most serious screw ups that AI could be responsible for is nuclear war. This is a very famous incident. You can look it up on Wikipedia called the Petrov incident. An, air, an airliner had been shot down accidentally by Soviet uh, air security. There's a lot of tension in the air, 1983. And the Soviets had just deployed a new early warning system. Petrov was a missile officer responsible for monitoring the output from the missile warning system. He saw a report of five US missiles. Petrov said to himself, this is not enough for a strike. The US would only send thousands on a first strike. It would never send five. He knew the, new, the system was new, so he ought to be skeptical. And he knew that the report came in too fast and a real report should have been thought over a little more. So he said, 
I'm going to hold up, not report it up the chain of command until I have more information. It looks like missiles, but you know, we don't want the nuclear war. He waited a bit and found there was no ground radar confirmation and just killed the report. Petrov helped to avert a nuclear war. Uh, most of us would have given him a medal and a raise and a promotion, but Petrov received a discommendation for failure to file appropriate paperwork. Okay, but what Petrov introduced into the loop was common sense. And that's one of the things AIs don't have. So we do not want an AI system making life critical decisions without a human in the loop. And our military systems are very careful about that. And one of my references in the reference section is Army of None. And um, that discusses the precautions taken to keep AI controlled systems, like I think the phalanx gun from shooting down airliners. Now, another major risk factor with AIs is something you probably all heard about, the bubble. That when you click on a link in Google, Google says, aha, it's AI says rather, aha, that person likes this kind of links and it will feed you more like that. And if you have a weakness for conspiracy theories and it's kind of in human nature to worry about conspiracies, we all think in terms of what are other people thinking, are they up to no good and so forth. We're primed for this just the way we're wired and it will take you down the red rat hole or the green or the blue rat hole, depending on your political preferences. The AI doesn't care about your politics. What it cares about is your clicks. It's busy thinking, how can I manipulate this guy to produce more clicks? And in order to avoid this, you have to do a lot of work. You have to make yourself see opposing views and so forth. I would recommend to all of you that you use say search engines like DuckDuckGo, which make a point of not bubbling you and of showing multiple views on the point so you can make the decision yourself and not have it made for you by an AI. And I'll put a link to that in the chat at the end of this talk. And another one, which has also been much in the news are what are called deep fakes, where you make something that looks like one person give- We're entering an era in which our enemies can make it look like anyone is saying anything at any point in time. Jordan Peele created this fake video of President Obama to demonstrate how easy it is to put words in someone else's mouth. Moving forward, we need to be more vigilant with what we trust from the internet. Not everyone bought it, but the technology behind such frauds is rapidly improving, even as worries increase about their. Okay. And in fact, you can actually buy an app called Avatarify, which will let you make your own deep fakes. I downloaded on my iPhone uh, last night to check this out. And yeah, um, you can take your grandma and have her speak with Lincoln's face and do all sorts of fun stuff. And I hope you won't do anything malicious with it. And now the six of our risk factors, and we're getting near the end of this talk, is the fact that if you are not paying for the product, you are the product. And that gets to the question of the first question in the Q&A, who owns the value system? Free is not free. You have to remember that, that you're being bid on every time you do a search, your clicks are being used for all sorts of potentially nefarious purposes, and Facebook, there was a recent case, um, they monitor every click and keystroke and they, uh, Facebook and other people's AIs use your clicks, including what you click on, the rate, whether you're hesitant or forceful or whatever, to assess your current emotional state so they can use that to manipulate you and to sell you ads that will, you'll click on. Uh, this has had some fairly scary side effects. AI, um, the Facebook, uh, a father found that his daughter was getting ads for pregnancy related products like, I don't know, My Doll or Blander Foods or what have you. Uh, he's getting them from Target. And he said to, you know, he was irate because he knew his daughter wasn't pregnant. 
he went to talk to her about this and it turns out she was pregnant and Facebook, which had passed the information along to Target, had known she was pregnant before the father did, and possibly before she knew that, because some of these patterns happened in the very early stages of pregnancy. Facebook denied it was doing this. It was, to be blunt, lying. And Soshana Zuboff um, has put out this book and is now advocating for better control of your data by you, and a good thing too. So, what is the basic problem with AI? Well, this is a fellow looking at the genie of AI. He's conjured it up off his laptop and here's genie smoke and this is the genie and it's doing what he told it to do. When we click on conspiracy links in Google, Google is serving, us, serving up more of that conspiracy because we asked it to. That's our reflection in the mirror. And we have to have an effort of will to seek out opposing points of view and more evidence before we arrive at a decision. It's on us, as the philosopher Pogo said, we have met the enemy and he is us. What do we do? Well, one of the concerns here is that the AI is going to take our jobs, but the reason it's not going to have much effect like that is actually an encouraging one. It's something known as Moravec's paradox. Chess is easy for AI to fix, but hard for humans. Chess is something we've only been doing for a few thousand years. The uh, last uh, little figure in my uh, background picture, um, and it's a mathematical thing. It's uh, got very definite rules. It's got a lot of structure and AI is good with chess. But there are other things that we take for granted, like being able to recognize grandma or simply to walk, it is hard for AI to know how to walk. And there are some hysterically funny YouTube videos of AIs being trained to walk and doing stuff like backward somersaults when we wanted them to walk forward or falling over because it satisfied the requirements of that. So things that are easy for us are often hard for AI. And the reason is that billions of years of evolution have given us the ability to do all kinds of things instinctively, um, which are actually very skillful. And we underestimate our own quality and uh, capabilities because we're just, we take it so much for granted. The mere fact that we know how to pay attention to uh, gossip or we can walk into a, a room of party goers and know who to talk to, whether to get a beer first or what have you, is a sign of how skillfully we put together multi-dimensional information to arrive at sensible conclusions. Now, one of the ways we do a better job with AI is to look inside and see what it's thinking. Current AIs can't tell you how they arrived at an answer, um, but there are tools out, like this is a, the product of a tool called Deep Dream, which lets you look at the intermediate stages in a neural net and say, and watch it as it oscillates between dog and cat. And why this tool shows you a lot of spiders, I have no idea. But Deep Dream is the kind of tool that can not only tell us more about AI, but it can also, because it works on neural nets, remember there's something that was just patterned after our own brains can be used to help us understand our own thought. And that's a very practical use and important. So, Intention must be paid. We have to look at data governance. We have to keep humans in the loop. We have to make sure the AI tells us what it's thinking. And we have to always hold the AI responsible. And that I think addresses some of the questions that I'm seeing in the Q&A uh, here. So will humanity be ascendant if we pay attention? If we pay attention. Okay, I'd like to thank uh, Fern uh, and Balticon and Lisa and Miriam and all those. And here are some references about AI. And I can now take, I'm not sure how much time I have left, uh, very little actually, uh, some questions from you guys. Um, okay. And I'm also going to cut and paste in the chat. Actually, how do I get this send chat to panelists and attendees? I'm putting the references uh, in the chat now, so you should be able to just cut and paste them. Yes, uh, that all came out. 
Uh, so um, any further questions? Uh, let me see. Oh, I see there are a bunch here. Uh, yeah. Okay, I see questions about uh, yeah, use of AI and deep fakes. I got that one. Well, that's a very clever idea. Couldn't the ostrich example provide some exquisite guidance for fabric texture designers? It could, I hadn't thought of that. And uh, yes. And the one question I don't think I've addressed uh, uh, in the talk itself is improvement with respect to chatbots. That's interesting. Um, at one level, the chatbots that you see on tech help screens you and the tech site are aligned in your intent. You both want to get the tech to work better. And that alignment keeps a lot of the bad stuff from happening. I think most of the chatbots have the same problem AI normally has. It has no ontology. So that would be my main um, suggestion for improvement is for the chatbots to actually know what they're talking about rather than do really clever pattern recognition. Okay, and Muriel uh, Hikes recommends, in addition to DuckDuckGo, uh, millionshort.com. So I will be sure to check that out afterwards. Okay, I think we've arrived at the end of our allotted time on this thing. So I have to hand control back to Balticon, who've done a great job supporting these talks. And I'll be over at Discord for a while uh, to take your questions. And you can also send an email to me and I put that in the chat. And if you put Balticon in the subject, I'll know it's from this uh, conversation and I'll do my best to answer those. Okay, and I'm only sorry that I couldn't see you in person and hear your questions in person because I love the interaction, the back and forth. Unlike an AI, I enjoy talking with people and hearing from them. Next year, we will be able to do that. But thank you for your attention. That was great. Okay, take care.